Hello my friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. Got a new project that I'm starting on this morning. It is a fiddle, an old violin. Francis Webb was the grandfather of my customer. My customer, I won't, I'll just give you the first name. Her, her first name is ben, Benita, B-O-N-I-T-A. And Benita wanted me to fix up her grandfather's fiddle. Francis Webb. He played this old fiddle at dances and things like that. So we're going to treat it with the sentimental respect that it needs and see if we can't fix it up. <music> Referred to on the label, it's an Antonio Stradivari um, I can't read it very well. The light's not very good. Cremona, Cremonis, yeah, Cremonis of uh, Fasibitano 1735, made in Germany. So by the fact that it's made in Germany, obviously it's not a real Stradivari. Uh, you know, and, and just for the record and for the folks out there that think every violin that has Stradivari inside is a Stradivari, they're not. 99.9% .9 of them, in fact, are not real Stradivaris. That one-tenth of one percent, pretty much everybody knows where all of those are. <laughs> so there's a bazillion of them out there that have his name in them, and almost all of them are reproductions. At the turn of the century, in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s, there were factories just turning out bazillions of these things. And what they typically did was put a date in them that was 200 years later than when Stradivari was building. In other words, he was building from the late 1600s to the early 1700s. So if it was 1890, they would put the date of 1690 in the violin when they made it. So, it, you know, to assimilate that it was a copy of one of his violins made in 1690. You know, and in this case, it says 1735. So that tells me, now it's not a black and white guarantee, but it, but I, it tells me that this was probably made 1935. Now that's just a guess. I, do, I am not an absolute fiddle expert. Um, I know a lot about them. I've seen and studied a lot about them before I ever built my first instrument. I read every single thing I could find on Stradivari. And I went to the public library every single day for months and read about uh, Stradivari. And you might say, well, that's an exaggeration. No, I mean every single day, every work day, I should say, for months, I, on my lunch hour, I would go to the library and read about Stradivari and Amati and all the different people that built violins, the old violin makers, and I tried to learn as many secrets from them as I could. Stradivari was the innovator. He's the one that came up with the two-piece back. Amati, before him, who was a Stradivari apprenticed under Amati, and Amati had a single-piece back. So Stradivari changed it to a, a dual piece back and book matched them and that gives you a better symmetry of tone across the back. And he also learned to carve them flatter. You notice how there's, there's an arch here of course, but it's not a giant arch and it's not a giant arch this way. He learned that you get a better resonant tone by carving them flatter. So that's a hint for everybody out there carving a mandolin or carving a violin. You know, you don't want a huge dome in your instrument. There you go. This one looks uh, pretty nice. There's, there's quite a few issues with it. It's got a pretty big crack right running up through here, uh, all the way up into the F hole. On one hand, it doesn't need much. On, another, on the other hand, uh, they all need a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, the, the pin back here is cocked a little bit, which is kind of typical. But there's no real string pressure on it now, so I'm assuming if we put a lot of string pressure on there, that'll cock up even more. And so we're going to take a look at this and see if we need to replace it or repair the block or whatever. We're going to definitely repair the crack. Uh, otherwise, structurally, this doesn't need a ton right now that I can see. 
So we're in pretty good shape. And since this is a sentimental build, we're going to try to leave it as original as possible. Uh, it looks like Grandpa may have made his own little inlay right here, and, and he may have even made the whole tailpiece, because it doesn't look like a standard tailpiece at all. Most standard tailpieces have a little uh, saddle across here, where the string rides up on that little saddle, then goes up over the bridge. This doesn't have that little saddle, as you can see. It's just straight. I assume that Grandpa made the whole tailpiece, that's just an assumption, and then he made his own little uh, inlay there too. So we're going to keep all of that original because of that. Now had she told me that this was not, you know, a garage sale find or whatever, I'd probably be replacing this with an adjustable tailpiece, one that you has the fine tuners built in. But because this was the way Grandpa played it, we're going to keep it pretty much like Grandpa played it. I might also show you this old bow. If this bow was up in good shape, this bow might be as valuable as the fiddle. In other words, it might be worth several hundred dollars, or perhaps even more than that. Uh, there's a real art to the bow as well as the violins. Sometimes the old bows are more valuable than the fiddles are. This one needs a lot of work. It's got a lot of issues. It's been cracked and broken and a lot of the inlay is missing. The inlay off of here is missing. So I'm going to see what I can do about fixing up this old bow for her as well. It does actually seem to have decent hair in the bow, so we may not have to rehair it. I'll look at that when I get to it. So that'll be down the road yet. So there you go. That's where we're headed. Come along for the ride. Because this is a sentimental build, I am not going to just cut these strings off and throw them away. I'm actually going to save them, coil them up, and put them in the case. And these would be the last thing on this old fiddle that Grandpa actually touched with his hands. So, I know some of you are not sentimental at all. I am a sentimentalist, and I do believe in uh, all of the sentiment that's attached to the instrument. I think that's more important than the instrument itself very often. Anyway, we will keep all this stuff. We won't be putting it back on the fiddle because it's old and it needs to, you know, it needs to rest. But we will save it. I'm not going to film any more of that, but I'll show you my next step here in just a minute. Just notice my first little issue with taking these strings off. This, again, I th pretty sh well, you know, I say it's homemade, but then again, I see these ripples down through there. That was done by a machine, so it may not be homemade after all. It was probably repaired home by uh, Grandpa, though, because this looks like a repair right here and this is cracked up through here. You know, I would like to keep this as original as possible, but this thing is kind of past its prime, honestly. I may have to replace this. This cord that's on here, I don't know how strong that is, but it's not fixable at this point. So I'm tempted to just put this in the case and say, and they could put this on display and hang it on the wall next to it or whatever, you know, as uh, this was the original tailpiece that Grandpa made or used or whatever. Because I don't think it's functional. And we want to fix this up where the fiddle will play and play well. And uh, I don't really feel like this is a functional part anymore. Now that I have the strings off of this and the tailpiece off, I see an even worse break right here. And the sad thing is that that's been re-glued already and it's not done well. Uh, Grandpa probably re-glued that, but it's not lined up at all. Uh, it's uh, bad. That's a shame. I, you know, fixing that is really difficult and we may just live with that. So, you know, I'll have to see how that goes as we get into it a little further. I'm going to line up this crack and get it glued back and get it clamped here. So that's going to be the first thing I'm going to do. But this one here is already re-glued and unfortunately it's not lined up at all. Well, I have some clamps here just kind of pre-adjusted to the approximate right size. So we'll set them aside and we'll use those in a moment. Right now, I'm going to uh, get glue down in here as best I can. It's a pretty tight crack, 
but I do think we can get tight bond in it. Um, trying to decide here if I can stretch it open a little bit and get more in there. I don't know. It's going to be tough. Yeah. I think what I'm going to do is get some warm water, wet the crack really good first, and that'll make the tight bond flow down in there much better. Okay, we're going to get started here. Got some warm water, got a paintbrush, and I'm just going to paint the crack here and wiggle it back and forth as I paint it even. And hopefully get some water down in the crack. You know, you might think, well, you're diluting your glue, but that's probably a tiny bit true. But the, the fact of the matter is, it just barely dampens the wood and the glue is very thick and it's really not going to create much of an issue that way. But it will help the glue slide down in the crack better and that's the goal for the reason I did it. Now I'm going to lift this up a little bit because that gives me access to this crack better. I know you can't see it from your angle but I can see the edge of the of the board and the crack and I can just put glue along that edge really easy this way and I'll wiggle it up and down like that a bunch of times and that'll get the glue down through there and then I'm actually going to do the opposite. I'm going to push it down. I'll push it down with my thumb and I'll put I'll use the brush here and work it into the crack and then I'll have to pick it back up with something else because I can't get my hand in there very easy and I'm going to do the same thing on this side paint it in there back and forth just wiggling it up and down until I am satisfied that I've got the glue down in the joint pretty good then I'm going to wipe off the extra the reason I want to get it clean like that too is now I can tell did I get glue down in there because when I start pulling this together we should see glue squeezing out if it's if it's together I think we will I think we'll see glue squeezing out and you can you can see the glue squeezing out all the way down through there so it's working pretty well trying to level it out get it just as level as I can and then tighten the clamps down even more so I'm going to get a little moisture on this towel so that I can clean off the glue that's here and check the fit and it looks really perfect it really looks perfect it's a little bit off down here odd, oddly enough and the it's just a tiny bit off down here and that's going to be the hardest place to line it wouldn't you know of course it would have to be there what I'm going to do now is take wedges and put them in here and hopefully tighten this part of the crack up. I think that's going to work. Now you might say what well, you're not cleating this because you're just gluing it together. Typically a crack like this has very little stress on it. I don't know what caused the crack. It could have got bumped. I, I don't know. It could just been drying out air type th thing that, you know, the body changed shape and it caused it to crack. I don't know. But typically this type of crack doesn't have it that much stress on it, so you don't really need a cleat. A cleat wouldn't hurt anything, but you don't typically need them. This this wood glue is so strong that it will typically uh, keep it perfectly in alignment and you know keep it together. Shouldn't be a problem. But that's about all I can do on it right now. I don't want to keep bumping it around because I'm afraid I'll get it out of alignment. So I'm just going to set it on the shelf for a while and let that cure. Violins get a lot of their strength from this end pin, believe it or not, because your tailpiece is hanging on this. So for me, this is the, one of the most critical fit-ups there is. This had a little piece of cloth or tape around it to tighten it up, but look how loose it is. I mean, like it's not even sort of tight. And that's not good because this gets pulled up like this and then it starts to act like a wedge and it breaks everything out of the back end. When I buy replacement pins, I always buy them with that are not pre-cut. I don't want them pre-cut. I want the full size. And you can see there that this one here, um, even though it's full size, it's already going in more than halfway. 
So it isn't going to take much to get this to work. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to put a reamer in here. And, and the only reason I'm doing that, I don't really want to make the hole any bigger. I'm just putting the reamer in here to make sure that the hole is clean and straight. And I can feel something in there already. There's just something bumping. It's just not... That doesn't feel right already, I can tell you. I don't know what's wrong, but there's something wrong. I don't really know what it is, but there's something wrong. I'm gonna see if I can shine this light down in there and look through the end pin hole. And I guess it was some kind of cloth that was in there that got pushed out. Maybe that's already out of there now. It may have been glued in there. Anyway, I've gotta make sure that hole's completely clean. And it's clean now. And then what I try to do too is see if it's straight. And this one is pretty straight, but it's not, it's not really perfect. But it's, it's not too bad either. So I'm gonna go ahead and just try to straighten it a little bit, clean it up a little bit more. I'm putting pressure that way to clean it up a little bit and straighten it a little bit. Yeah, it doesn't feel right. I, I'm really concerned that there's something wrong inside here. That may be the uh, sound post flopping around, but I think there's something else in there too. I'm fairly sure there's something blocking the hole. It's so weird. Well, it's, it's starting in there, so now once I get it started in there straight like that, and, and I think it's gonna tighten up, because now I can feel it's gotten tight, I could actually pick up the whole fiddle by that now. So once I start to feel that, and can tell that it's actually bottoming out or, or the sides are making contact all the way around is what I really mean. Then I just start doing this and this is a little bit weird. Uh, a lot of people you know, think I should just use a reamer, but I do it this way and I just, I go around it. I just turn this a little bit and I just scrape it. And then when I put it back in there, it's all dull right now as, you, as you'll see here in a moment. I do this as a uh, fitting technique to make it fit absolutely perfect. Now it takes a few minutes. It's not a, you know, if you're an impatient person, you're not gonna wanna do this. But, but that, you can see how dull that looks all the way around. Okay, now I'm gonna sit it in here and I'm gonna spin it. And that spinning will cause it to get shiny wherever there's high spots. Now. They're not easy to see, I'll admit, but it's actually making really good contact all the way around. It's shiny, the whole end of it's shiny. So what I'm gonna do is just do that again, and really, the, you just do this a bunch of times, and if you do it well, you'll have a very tight-fitting pin when you're done. It seems like it will take forever, but if you do it, once you get in a rhythm of doing it, like I'm you know, getting here now, I'm starting to get faster at it, it uh, you can do it pretty fast and it will make it fit absolutely perfect. You could do it with a reamer and make it, you could do a much quicker job, but I don't think you'll do as any better job. When I'm done with these, these are so tight that you'll, you cannot pull them out by hand. See, it's going in a little further each time, but not much. And I keep doing that until it goes in there to the point where I can't, uh, where maybe I've just got just the least little bit to go, and then I'll just bump it in the rest of the way by hand. If you know what you're looking for, you can see how shiny it gets right on the end there. And you, each time you go around this, you want to get rid of all that shiny stuff. And then sometimes I'll cut back the other way like this to make sure I'm getting right up to the neck of this. It's getting really hard to spin. It's, it's so tight already that it's, it's almost impossible to get it out once you get it in there now. And by spinning it also, I'm sure that it's uh, smoothing out the internal part of that too. All right, well, I'm almost there. I'll probably do the rest of this off camera and I'll get, when I get it right up close to that fit, I'll show you what I do. All right, just a few more of those tests and I was just about there. It's, you can see there that it's already snug that far in, but as I start to spin it and push it in, 
it, it's going almost all the way. And now I can just push it in that last little bit by hand and there is no way you're going to pull that out of there. Now I'm going to go through and check all these joints. I really think there's problems here. Um, actually, I think this whole end may be a problem. I may clean this whole thing out and try to fit it up a little better. The glue is kind of sticking out here. I can see the whole back end's loose. This is where all the strength comes from is right here. This is what happens is this gets pulled out, especially if this pin's not right. And so what I'm going to try to do is hold all this in there, clamp it and glue it, and uh, it'll be a lot better. I'm just going to keep cleaning this out until I get this whole joint loose right back through here. And then once I think I've got all the glue cleaned out of there, I'll show you where I'm, what my next step is. Okay. You know, again, this is a budget job, so this is not the way I would necessarily do, uh, you know, a high-end violin, but this is not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to just make it playable and make it last for the lady. That's all she wants. She doesn't want to spend a lot of money on it. It's just a keepsake from her grandfather. I'm sure Grandpa is the one that glued this up the last time, and uh, that's partly why it didn't hold here I think. I've cleaned the joint out as good as I can clean it out with my knife. Here I'm actually going to try to get a little bit of the glue to go down in there by getting the knife in there a little bit better and maybe here too. I'm going to clean that off and then I'm going to put the clamps on it and let it set overnight. So you can see there I've got her clamped up pretty well. Got all the old glue that was piled up there out of there. That ought to hold, I think. I'm gonna keep looking it over and see if I find other places. It looks like this might be a crack. Yep, it is. Right here, there's a little crack. Right in that little spot there, there's just a little crack. We're gonna see if we can't open that up a little bit more so I can get glue in there. So I think if I press down on it, I can get glue in there. Probably should have wet that one down. And in hindsight, I think I'll just do that anyway. I'll just go ahead and get the glue off of there and wet this down. That'll help the glue flow down in there better because it's really a tight crack there. I just wet it down and just wiggle the crack back and forth like that by hand until I'm fairly satisfied that the water's down in there. Now I'm going to force the glue down in there with the bottle. I'm actually using the glue, the bottle, as kind of a, you know, a syringe type deal where I'm pushing it down in there. I'll paint it down in there with the brush. I don't think it's going to be an issue. I'm pretty sure I've got it covered. You know, wipe all the extra glue off of it. Then I'll just get some sort of a wedge deal and I'll lift it up and that's the trick on some of these things is you have to lift them up opposite way that they want to go before you wedge them and so I'm going to lift this up like this and then try to wedge it in place to hold it there and it doesn't want to stay up it wants to go down and that's the kind of thing you run into I don't know what I'm going to do to keep that up. Maybe I can get something else in the end here. Nope, it wants to go down. I, I really would like for that to stay up because that's the way it needs to be to line up. And if I could put the wedge in from the other side, it would. Yeah, it doesn't want to. I'm not exactly sure what I'll have to do there to get that to stay up, but I'll figure out something. If I could lay, lay something on here very lightly, I think that would be enough. I don't need much. I don't know if that's enough to hold it or not. Probably not. It's probably not heavy enough. It's close to heavy enough, but it's not. That looks like that might do it. I know you can't really see what I'm doing there. I put this in, you know, like if you press down, that lifts it up. If you, on this side, if you press down, it lifts it up. I've got just enough pressure on it with this block of wood on both of those things that it's holding it right where I want it. So I'm just gonna let that set. I'm not gonna touch anything. And a couple hours or so, that'll be stuck and it won't move anymore. I'm gonna start with uh, the bottle calls light brown. 
it's got more reds in it and I think that would match this better um, it may not be dark enough and I can see that it's pretty quickly it's gonna not be dark enough and that's okay you can always go darker it's a little harder to bring it lighter so that's why I thought I'd start with that I don't think it's going to match it too well though it's not far off if if it would stay on thick like that it's not far off Looking pretty good there now if it'll stay that color it it might and it might not this uh, light brown everyone always tells me it has a lot of red in it so I thought that would be the match for this because this for my eyes looks like it has some red in it but again being colorblind who knows I may be way off looks better than the big white spots though so at least I think it does it looks like I see a nail driven in right here, which is never a good thing. Don't ever drive nails in a violin or really any instrument or screws or anything. They're meant to be done with wood and wood only and glue and joinery and things like that. So just don't ever do it. If you get the urge and you don't know any other way to do it, either call me, text me, or come see me and I'll show you a better way. This is going to be under the tailpiece anyway, so this isn't all that terribly critical. I just thought I'd try to keep it from standing out. If you look under the tailpiece, you probably won't see it with adding this color to it. I'm going to blot it up a little bit there to help it dry a little faster. The thing about this stuff is if you put it on once, it goes on really light. If you put it on again, you can darken it up a little bit. So you can make it match a lot of things even when it's really technically only one color by just putting it on multiple times a lot of the worn spots like up here where he had his hand I'm sure I'm not gonna fix that because that's you know it's not really damages as much as it is just showing use of the fiddle and I don't fix those kinds of places I fix places that are chipped or you know that look out of place but the actual wear spots I typically don't fix that's probably gonna be it for this one I'm not gonna do a lot on it maybe around this F hole here because that's where people are putting in the sound post all the time and they chip it out quite a bit all right I think we're gonna get some strings and get started setting this thing up okay we're at the setup point now this is where it you typically have to make decisions you know um, I would like to use the original tailpiece because grandpa had modified it and all that but it was also very um, weak and very unstable and he had modified it in such a way that I couldn't remodify it if you will to make it more stable I mean I could but it would take an at least a, an, a minimum of an hour's worth of work at least that and probably still wouldn't be as good as this one that I can, you know, sell her for. I can sell this for around $20, $25. And if I charged her an hour's labor for the other one, we'd be $100 just for the labor. And it wouldn't be as good as this. It wouldn't have these fine tuners built in and all that. So it just makes sense uh, to, to put on a new tailpiece and keep the old tailpiece for the nostalgia and uh, you know keep the old uh, case and all those parts and everything and even the old strings and then you can put that on display and have the fiddle set up where it'll actually play like a modern fiddle and so that's what we're doing here that's my decision and I'm gonna stick to it I'm sorry if that flies in your face but uh, you got to do what you got to do and you got to make sense for the customer and I know that this particular customer doesn't want to spend a lot of money on this thing so I'm trying to keep the cost down in addition so all things said that I really think we're making the right decision now we are going to have to fit a new bridge to this someone said they thought this uh, you know looked like it was very low the angle um, 
it's not high, I'll admit that, but I, I don't consider this one low, I don't think, compared to a lot of them I see, though it is lower than perhaps I would set it if I was setting it up from scratch. Like right now, I, I like to see them at about uh, seven eighths of an inch, somewhere in there. This is probably closer to three quarters. In fact, it is, it's just a little over three quarters, so it's at uh, 13 sixteenths. I'd really like to see it at about uh, seven eighths. So it's a little, a little bit lower than I like, but it's, it's still higher than many of them. And it'll work, we'll make it work. So I'm not going to uh, film the whole setup of this, but I'll film key points that you might be interested in. One of the key points is the uh, scale. Most full-size violins set up at 325 millimeters. This one, if I set it at 325, which would be right there, it's way in front of the marks that go here. So this one has a longer scale for whatever reason, it just does. So I'm not gonna go by my 325. I think I'm gonna go by um, 330, which is close. It's only five millimeters longer, but I'm just gonna use that as my arbitrary scale. That I don't like to change my scale, but you know, some instruments, they just look better. And they're gonna sound better if you get this approximately in the center of the back here and and these little marks on the F holes is, is your typical uh, lineup for that. The first thing I'm going to do is cut off these feet and get them fitted to the top. So my method is just simply put the bridge about where you want it. Typically by the way your uh, label goes to the back on your bridges and uh, so I've got it sitting approximately where I want it. And now what the trick is to keep your pencil at a consistent height. And what I do is I try to find where the pencil's gonna come across and cut off most of the feet without cutting off all of the feet. You really don't want a big foot left. So I, my lines are kind of just for reference. I don't necessarily have to cut to those lines, but that gives me the shape of the top. So I can parallel to that and cut off as much of that as I feel like I should cut off. And if you look at it real close, you can really take off quite a bit of the feet. And you, you do want to do that. You want to get it nice and trim and small. Um, that's just the way violins are set up. So I think this chisel should be long enough to go across the whole feet. Uh, it sort of is, but I'm going to get one that's just a little bit wider. I like to be able to trim the whole thing at one time. And the thing about this is you want to trim as minimal amount as you can on a per cut. You really want to take very small, thin slices. And the reason for that is the wood will just chip out and break out really bad if you don't. If you can keep it very thin slices, then typically you'll be fine. You can see I've taken off four slices there. I'm not quite to the mark, but on the other hand, I don't have to go to the mark. What I'm trying to do is stay parallel to the mark and, you know, leave a enough foot there that it's going to support it, but yet get as have it as minimal as possible. I'm going to take one more little tiny slice and I think I'm going to call that good. So I took off um, five total slices there. And we'll do something similar to this side. Of course it helps if you've got a really sharp chisel when you're doing this. And my chisels are pretty darn sharp. So you want to keep them that way. Otherwise, you'll break the wood. And I think that's going to be it for the shaving part. I'll move on to the next. Now, this next step, most people go this way with sanding. I don't like that method at all. And the reason I don't is because it t you tend to rock like this. And your feet get rounded on the corners. I much prefer, and I think it's much more accurate. And there's another benefit, I'll tell you about that to go this way. 
I just go very, very, very short strokes. You can see I'm probably not going an eighth of an inch off a of center in either direction. Less, probably less than an eighth of an inch. And I can put good downward pressure on it. Now the additional advantage is I can also keep the bridge cocked just ever so slightly backward. And the reason you want to do that is because they always pull forward. So if you can keep it just a tiny hint of a backward lean to it, uh, it'll pay big dividends as you're stringing the instrument up and, and as you tune it. Now if you've cut them well with the chisel, and if you marked it well with the pencil and then cut it well with the chisel is the better way to say it, then you don't have a ton of sanding here. That's looking pretty good already. It does look like it needs, the outside ends need to be sanded a little bit more though. And so I'm going to put it back on here and hit it a little bit more. And if you've done it well, it ought to sit there pretty easily without too much trouble. So you can see it sets there pretty well. It's like I'm not having to, you can even tap it and it sets there pretty well because it's really fit to the top. So it fits really, really well. Now, once I've got the feet set, then I turn my attention to the height of the bridge. Again, I'm keeping it about where I want it. And the way I do this is I do it almost all from the treble side. And I start out kind of paralleling it like so. And then when I get to the middle or so, I start to kind of angle the pencil this way. And the reason I do that is because for the most part, you want a long slope on the treble side and a kind of a, a little bit more of a fall off on the bass side. And then I come back over here and I kind of mark where the bass line is under there. And I just do that like that. And I, I just use experience to kind of come up with my own uh, cut line there and uh, the way to make the bridge fit this neck real well. I don't quite cut all the way down to my pencil line. In fact, I'll try to pencil in about where I'm gonna cut this, and it's gonna be real close to the pencil line, but just a teeny bit above it. The darker line there is a little closer to what we're gonna have when we're done. So, I'm gonna go over and cut that now, and often I just do go to the sander and sand it I'm not sure where I turned the camera off, so let me explain that I'm going to, you know, thin this down. You can see right now it's really thick. It's, it's very thick. It's like a two by four. And I've already carved a little bit of it off camera. But it's very thick, and you don't want it to be a thick bridge or it won't transfer your sound. So that's where the finger plane comes in. The first thing you have to do is quickly determine where which way it wants to be carved. This one wants to be carved this direction. The other thing you have to watch is when even with the finger plane is that you can break these little decorative pieces off. This, this, and this can break off very easily. So when I get to those, I want to carve this way on this one. I want to try to carve this way on this one and this way on this one as much as I can because otherwise if you if you just go straight this way it'll just break these right off and it'll break this. This can break off also especially if you go sideways on this one. So you have to pay attention to that. Ask me how I know that. This takes quite a bit of carving, but you can do it and you can keep it very flat if you pay attention to what you're doing. This is a very high grade bridge. Um, it's very tightly sawn, quarter sawn wood. I don't know if you can even see the grain there, but I'll try to hold it still. Very tightly quarter sawn, a lot of figure in the grain, so it's a very high quality bridge. But it does not want to be carved that way at all. It wants to be carved this way. And, and you, if you're asking why, it's because the grain is running... Um, it's hard to explain that, but the grain would be kind of overlapping like this. And if you're carving this way, no problem. You, you can carve that way, no problem. But if you carve this way, you're carving into the end of that grain and it wants to chip out and break out. So you really have to determine that very quickly, otherwise you can really make a mess. 
Now the trick is on something like this where where you can break this off, you got to be very careful. I take my carving down to this base area. I don't go down to the feet, but I go down into the base. And we still have quite a bit to carve off here. You can see quite a bit of the shavings that I've carved off already. This thing carves much faster than you think, these little finger planes, when you learn how to use them. You can take off a lot of wood in very short order. The other part of the trick of carving these is you'll get thin spots if you're not careful on your edge. So you want to really look at that a lot and, and try to keep your edge even. You can go pretty thin on these. The only thing about going real thin is that you really have to then have a lot of care in how you uh, keep your strings lined up and, and you keep the bridge standing up straight. If you get the bridge off at an angle, it will bend your bridge in half or bow your bridge when you carve them thin enough. This one, I'm going to leave a little thick intentionally because first of all, the lady that owns this, I don't think plays at all. Um, Secondly, uh, it's probably going to be a wall hanger most of its life and uh, you know it doesn't need a perfectly set up bridge and it will last longer on display if the bridge is just a little bit big. I'm not leaving it large. I mean you, it's going to be playable but I'm not going to go to the extreme that I might for a, a concert violinist. That's pretty good. That's pretty flat. So. The next thing I do, and it's going to be hard to show you because the carpet's in the way, but I'll lay this sandpaper down on a flat part of a table like this, and then I'll go with the grain and make sure that this thing is, is really flat. You know, a lot of the violin makers would say, you don't do this, you don't ever want to sand them. It's really not going to make any difference. They think that they know everything and that it's going to really make a difference in the sound. It's not. You, you know, you just clean it up like that and the little bit of dust that's in those pores, which keep in mind maple has about the tiniest pores in the world, it's not going to make any difference. And what little bit would be in those pores, and I'm pretty sure there's almost none, uh, would vibrate out in no time at all once you start playing the instrument. So there's that. Okay, so we're just about ready with that part. It's uh, pretty much pretty much done. We still have a fairly tall bridge. Uh, by the way, referring to the bridge uh, and some people saw me cut all that off there and you think well that means this is really low again I've already addressed that this is not real low it's a little bit low and uh, those bridges I buy them in the full size they're unfitted and that means that you do need to cut quite a bit off of most of them because they come oversized okay now we'll move on to actually putting the strings on this and the package probably has a color code, which is always great for me because I can't really see the colors that well. It says the G is, the, is this one, but this one doesn't look as large to me as some of the other ones, but I guess it is. I guess it's the largest. All right, so this is the G, and I'm pretty sure that's the green one. I can... I can match up colors fairly well like I can see that that looks like that color there or pretty close to it. it's the closest one there out of these so I don't see black and white it's just I don't just don't see colors as well as everybody else apparently all right before I can put the string on it though I'm gonna have to at least get the tailpiece fitted that's another advantage to this type of tailpiece uh, it has the nylon uh, strap here and adjusters and it's much easier to fit it really well to this and do a good job and in fact it's already fitted perfectly as far as I'm concerned now that doesn't always happen that's not always the case you want a little bit of gap between this tailpiece saddle here and uh, the end of the tailpiece in other words you don't want the tailpiece itself riding on this saddle and we've got just a little gap there uh, less than an eighth inch, about a sixteenth of an inch, and so that to me is really pretty darn good. 
all this extra thread on here, which you can screw these in and out to adjust it. Uh, we don't need all this extra thread, so I'm going to cut most of it away. I'm going to leave a little bit there, but I'm, you know, I'm going to cut most of it away. And the reason is because I don't want it vibrating. Well, they've somehow incorporated nylon or uh, aluminum into those threads. Most of these only have uh, nylon threads, but that has been somehow it goes from nylon uh, to aluminum. I don't know if that's good or not. It may be a weak point, but we're gonna consider it good for now. And we've got the G-string here. We're going to set it into the little fine adjuster. Come up to the peg box. I do them in order of the closest to the nut. And so the G is the closest to the nut and I start by winding them away from the handle. In other words, this I'm calling this the handle, the knob or whatever. And I start by winding them that way. After I wind about a wind or two, wind and a half or two, then I come back across my wind and I wind toward the little handle or the nut. That locks it in where they can't pull out. I'm not going to put little notches in the, for the strings, at least not yet. And let's see, the E string is supposedly the red one, and this one looks like it's the red one compared to the other two. Again, I'm going to, at first, wind away from the uh, handle, winding it toward the center of the peg box. And three, three rounds on this one I think is gonna be good. And then I'm crossing back over and winding it toward the handle. Again, that locks the string in, it will not pull out now. Now, when you do this, we don't have the sound post set yet, so you don't want a lot of strength on this. You just really want them kinda just snug but loose. Now, my next one's gonna be the uh, D string. So that's this odd colored one here. According to this, I don't know what color that is. I don't know if that's gray or pink or what it is. But anyway, that color there, whatever that is. Maybe you can tell. I'm going to show you something here. I think you can see it. But the old hole, if you look at the old hole in there on this peg, maybe you can see it. I hope you can. I hope there's enough light. Get the light down here. And the old hole was over close to the uh, treble side of the peg box. I moved, I drilled a new hole over here because you're as you're pushing the peg in, uh, this hole could get covered by this side. So you want your holes on the, on the large, on the, on the handle side of the peg. You want your holes always on the handle side of the peg inside the peg box because you're always pushing that way as you're tightening these up. So I had to redrill those holes. Again, I don't want really any tension on these yet, just enough to hold the bridge in place. That's all I want. And we'll put the final string on and we should be good to go. Loosening that one up a little bit. Now they're all nice and loose. And I'm gonna look down it and, and kind of get it all set about where I want it aligned with these little marks on the F holes. So I'm going to go there and call that good. Now I don't really know how many millimeters that is. It, I, it doesn't really matter because I'm not setting it to my standard anyway. But that's actually about 332 millimeters. And it's just that this body, the neck and everything is just different on this violin compared to the average. All right, so that looks pretty good. Um, I can tell that the strings are very high up here at the nut, in my opinion. They should almost be touching the fingerboard. So I'm not gonna worry about that right now. We're gonna turn our attention to the inside and try to uh, fish out the uh, sound post that's in there and see if we can reset it or if we need to make a new one. I have a lot of sound post 
uh, setting tools. I have a deal here that measures the length of the post by sliding this up and down and checking the height inside. I have a professionally made tool for sound posts and things, which I don't really like. And I have my homemade one, which is made out of a piece of coat hanger with a tiny little hook on the end. I really like that one. It has an adjuster on this end. I can reach in there. I can set the sound post with the hooked end and then the big hook, I can pull it back if I need to. But I'm looking for one more tool that for some reason today I cannot find. And I don't know why, because I typically can find it. Um, I'm looking for a little tool that reaches in this hole and grabs a sound post when it's laying down and pulls it out. I don't know where that tool is. I cannot find it today. So I'll have to just do the old fashioned method of just fishing it out. And I know it's in there, I know it's loose, but right at the moment, I can't see it. There it is. Okay, there it is finally. And what I'm going to try to do then, I think he's got a string tied to it, and that's one of the old timer methods for putting a sound post in, is you put a string through, and you pull the string through both sides, and then you can adjust it with your string by moving back and forth. You know, if, he, if this wasn't so elaborate, I would probably go ahead and uh, possibly reuse it, but because it is so elaborate, I think I'm going to let them put this on display. I think it's kind of cool the way he did that. I always select a very high grade a piece of spruce, quarter sun spruce, and I don't know if you can see the green pattern there, but the, the grain runs one way, and you want to put the grain in perpendicular to the top. So it's all, everything's critical. This should fit through here without any problem. I uh, measured it ahead of time and, and cut it down to the proper size. Now I'm going to measure for length, and I'll use this tool for that. This can slide up and down inside there. And I'm going to get it really close to where I think it needs to go. I have to look inside there and try to uh, determine the best place for this. And it's a little bit of a touch and go on this. I'll be honest, it's, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes. You just tighten that down once you get it in, sp in the space and it's kind of sitting up there by itself. And so that should be the proper length for this. As usual, I always try to sneak up on things. So I always cut everything just a tiny bit long, but not much long. So I'm going to try to line up the foot with this really well. And then I'm just going to, I'm going to try to mark it really well too. So I know where I think the mark is. So I'm marking it to the exact length, but when I cut it off, I'll cut it off just a hair longer than that. That gives you that little fudge factor. And in this case, I can cut it off right here and I'll just cut and leave every bit of my pencil mark. The inside of the pencil mark would be the right length. So I'm cutting it about a pencil mark long. As I mentioned, look at the grain and you want to bevel the ends to match the inside of the top a little bit. You can do that with a file. You know, you can imagine that the inside of this top is going to be curving down like this on this side. And the inside of the bottom is going to be curving up also. So I want to file this off to match those curves. And again, I want to file it off with the grain perpendicular. I have my little vise here and I'll move you over here and let you see what I'm doing. Okay, so the vise is right here and this will just give me a little better way to hold it, that's all. And I'm not clamping that in there very tight, I'm mostly holding it by hand, but that just keeps it a little stable. And then I'm going to carve a slight angle into this. Actually my uh, file is moving directly into those grain lines. That file's not working all that well for me. I'm going to get a little, little bit better file. This is a double cut file. It'll cut a little, little bit better. I'm not putting a huge angle in it, but I'm putting an angle in it until I get all the way across the end. And there I've reached the other side. So, all right. And then what I typically do is knock down these little 
corners a little bit so that they're not going to grab just a little bit you know just just rounding them over just a little bit and now I have to be very careful that I turn it the opposite way in other words both short uh, edges are on the same side if that makes sense to you I, it's hard to explain some of these concepts for whatever reason that side filed a lot easier so that one's done already now the hope is I didn't get it too short you know and you don't know till you know now so we can move everything out of the way and see if we can get the sound post to sit in there odds are on the first try it's uh, I'd say it's about a 80 20 80 that it won't fit and 20 that it will but you never know so I take that little thread uh, that little hook that I have and thread it into the grain perpendicular again stick it through the hole mount the bottom foot about where I think I want it put push whoops it came off already that didn't work too well let me try it again by doing that hole you can get back in that same hole and lift it back out of there I don't know it's for some reason this one's not cooperating as much as some of them usually it's not too hard but again we don't even know if the length is right yet so we're it's all trial and error right now well it's it's standing and it's not looking too bad ah oh, I had it and then I bumped it knocked it over just about had it well, anyway, you can see my process. I'll go ahead and do that part off camera to quit eating up so much time. And uh, I'm just setting it in there, you know, trying to get it to sit straight up and down about right here, just a little bit behind the uh, treble foot. Okay, I got the uh, sound post set in there. That didn't take long. It just, you know, it's a tedious operation. And now I'm gonna start tensioning the strings now you don't want the sound post directly under the foot and the reason is it'll be really harsh transferring the sound through so you want it just behind the, the uh, foot and that lets the vibration start to transfer out into this top yet it'll be carried to the back by the sound post you can really hear a difference in the fiddle sound if you get the sound post in the wrong place Okay, before I go to the trouble of tightening these up a lot, I'm going to go ahead and cut these notches a little deeper because th th this is really sitting up high from my perspective anyway. Take a file here that I think is going to be appropriate size. See if I can get the string out of the slot. Well, for some reason that string feels like it's already locked in that slot. I think the slot's really tight. Yeah, it's like it's holding it. I can't get it out. Yeah, that's not good. You never want your the slots to be that tight. Ah, I can't even get it out. There it is, I finally got it out. So that's not good, so we're gonna wanna open this slot up. That's the first thing. Because if you don't have it wide enough, it can be riding on the sides, and you definitely don't want that. So, and then when you put this angle in, you kind of approximate your peg box angle, but not quite that, not quite that steep. You don't need it to be real steep. But you want the, the last place it touches to be on the inside edge of the nut. And I'm looking to see about the height now to see if it looks like it's low enough. That's better, but it could go lower. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and take it out of there again. It's much easier to get it out of the slot that time. I think that's going to be pretty close. Yeah, that's much better. Now it's just, just a very easy touch to get it down to the fingerboard. Okay, I finished up the rest of the nut slots off camera there. And uh, it's really ready to just tune it up. So I'm going to take it up slow.
All right, now, as you're doing that, your bridge is going to want to walk forward, so you always want to keep your bridge standing straight up and down, as straight up and down as you can get it. There's still something loose inside this thing, so I'm going to have to figure that out yet, too. But we're doing pretty good. These strings are a little bit high off the neck. I, I could cut this bridge down some more, and I may decide to do that, because it is just a little bit high. It, a little bit hard to play um, you know it's a lot of people play them this high but I would prefer to have them a little bit lower and if, especially if she's going to try to learn to play this at all we're going to want this down just a little bit more so I think I'll loosen the strings a little bit before I get them to full pitch and and I'll take this uh, bridge out hopefully the the uh, sound post will stay where it's at and I'm going to cut this down just a little bit more I'm just going to do it kind of by eye. I kind of know what I need. A little bit kind of like that. It's kind of a vicious cycle. When you cut some height off your bridge, then your bridge gets thick again on the end because you're, you know, it's wedge shaped. And so I'm going to go ahead and take off a little bit more thickness off of that also while I'm at it here. And again, I have to remember I can only go this one way. This bridge just doesn't want to be cut in any other direction. That's looking pretty good. I'll flatten it again with some sandpaper. Just okay, I've re-flattened it a little bit on the table with some sandpaper. I did that off camera, of course. Now I can set it back in place. Now this time we ought to be pretty good. And I'm going to start worrying about the, or setting up the, uh, width of the strings here also, because I haven't really paid much attention to that yet. I like to spread my strings out over the full width of my bridge. A lot of people center their strings in the bridge, but I prefer to have them spread out a little bit. I think it gives you a better sound overall. I'm gonna call that pretty good. I'm just doing it kind of by feel and by look. I can kind of feel if they're hitting my fingers in the same place. Looks and feels pretty well, so I think we're in good shape. Now I'm going to go ahead and get it up to pitch. I do have this uh, fiddle all set up and relatively in tune. I actually have it tuned a little bit sharp because it keeps dropping and they all do that until they settle in. So there's no telling if it's even in tune at this moment right now because they change at a moment's notice. But overall it looks pretty good. You can see the spots I touched up there that uh, they blend in pretty well. You can hardly even tell it. It's a pretty decent little fiddle. I wouldn't mind owning that one. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you.